Number one. Yep. And today's guest, we've got London's Vic Dark. First of all, Vic, just want to say thanks for coming on the show. Nice to meet you, mate. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. You've had a very colourful life, Vic. Spent over 20 years in prison, been charged with murder, been charged with robberies, had shootouts with police, but now you're very anti knife crime. You're doing a lot to try and help others not make the same mistakes you did. But I always go back to the start of my guess, Vic, kind of where you grew up and how it all began for you. Okay, yeah. Well, went back to the East Ends. Obviously, my dad was a Maltese immigrant. My mum was ginger, so really base. I didn't stand off on a, a good foot. That uh, We lived behind a junk shop. We grew up through uh, poverty, really, basically. So when we, you know, so it was hard, really. And my dad was quite dark-skinned at the time. He was like an Asian-looking type skin he had. He was quite dark-skinned. And then, obviously, we had no money. So we grew up around the East End. So really, we was like scallywags, basically. You know, our, our, our dinner would be like baked beans, mash, and a tin of like corned beef. And that's how we grew up. So the kids today, it's so different to what we had. You know, we, we didn't even have a bath. Yeah. There's one of them situations where um, it's a really basic, basic getting back to criminality. That's where I suppose it started, basically. So survival mode back in the day? Yeah. It, you know, most people like myself, we're not really into um, crime. You know, if I, if I was, I had a few quid and I had, had quite a lot of money, I wouldn't be, I would never have been a criminal in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think what it is, is just how you grow up in them environments, really. And uh, like I said, we had, I had a, the problem what I had when I was a kid was um, that look down, you know, like, you know, you, they looked. I felt people looked down on me because we never had nothing. You know, it was like to get a pair of trousers was second hand, or so really basically. So the only way I knew was like going into like Bearmans, them type of things, and, and stealing trousers for school. And that sounds stupid, or smashing windows to get a shirt. And really basically, I wouldn't have been the same as every other kids, but but we wasn't really. It was just uh, um, back to poverty, really, from the East End. Yeah. Do you think that's where the crime then started slipping in because you didn't want people looking down at you, you didn't want to feel like worthless or were you getting bullied at any point in your younger years? Uh, I, I did a couple of times uh, but as later life grew on I, I dealt with the people who bullied me but I always stood my ground I always um, even though I was small and the kids would be a lot older than me I always stood my ground it was one of those situations where uh, you had to you know, and I think to this day, even though I've, I'm 63 nearly, I still got that something like someone gets in your face. I still got that sort of <clears throat> type of thing. You can't take it out of you because it's been put into you. And, end on you. and then, like I say, with obviously yourself coming from Glasgow, you you know more than most. You know, so mm -hmm. it's uh, how you grow up. You know. Yeah, yeah, a product of your environment. Yeah, basically, yeah. 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 So, how was your schooling and stuff? How was like secondary? Did you go to school much? Uh, I did, I did, but I was like a bit of a, a roguey type kid. Um, always looking. To, I think what it is when you when you're talking about crime, it's, like, it's always about money. And the big difference, the crossover between people like ourselves, is more about money. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go out my way to hurt anyone. I'm not going to go out the way to want to stab anyone like the kids today. It's more money orientated. It's more like um, everything I had to do was because we had no money, basically, you know. Yeah. When did you start getting into crime? Was it the petty stuff at the start? Yeah, Shoplifting, yeah, yeah, going nicking. Stealing it. cars? <laughs> well, the cars I was to nick was when I was about 10. It was, it was a thing called Scale Electric coming out of the time. <laughs> <laughs> was so, yeah, so yeah, the electric things that yeah, go yeah, around. Yeah, so that's the first cars I actually started. It was like electrics. Uh -huh. so it was like little electrics. So the go in, you used to have a long jacket, which was called a poacher's coat. And you'd, you'd, you'd put your hand in it and you've got a pocket and you'd go through the pocket, pick pick the stuff and just drop it into the other side. That's how we stole yeah. that. And that's how the first car we actually started with Sky Electrics. Yeah, yeah, all my uncles and my dad used to do it. It was like yeah. a duffel quart with like pouches. Yeah, that's it. Deal with yeah, the LPs yeah. and all this shit. But, um, yeah, that was about 10. I was about 10, 11, <laughs> yeah, about 10, 11, yeah. So it's, that's, that's the first car I actually stole. What was your first serious crime? Um... What violence was? Yeah. Was what age were you? Um, I think because I was brought up in a like a brutal type thing, the old man hit you with a belt or something. I thought like it, it was not normal to sort of like do the same thing back. Some of it, you know. So I, I took it from where kids would have a punch up. I took it from like different. I'd sort of like 
obviously it hits them with a ball, stab them inside. It was just one of those situations. And then and I was a dirty fighter at school, you know. They want to smash you up. I go, well, you're going to beat me up. I'm going to, I'm going to fight you back, you know. And then I think because I was brought up in that brutal nature that I thought is right. And the good thing about it today, it's like I've never touched one of my kids, you know. It's only, it's just something that's ingrained in you. What we stood through there, my dad brought me up. It would never happen in my situation, you know. So so really basically, you never sort of backhand a kid or, you know, where I was backhanded. So really basically, you know, even today, it upsets me because I was, it brought me up like it did. So I suppose it brought me up because it made me stand up for myself, you know, and, you know. Yeah, that's just, it's still a sense of abuse though, getting slapped and kicked around. Yeah. And it can, yeah. that's trauma as well, where yeah. that's where people can just go fuck this and have that snapping point. Yeah. Where they just start yeah. fighting back. Yeah. Because you're very big on martial arts. I've spoke to a couple of people who says you can scrap, you can, you can really take care of yourself. How did you get into the martial arts side of things? Um, someone hit me over the head with a bottle. I was about, 13 and I joined uh, so at the time Bruce Lee had just come out and that's how stupid Enter the Dragon yeah yeah and, and I thought yeah and and I always been sort of sport sport orientated running or something like that so I went into martial arts by the time I was 14 karate and I got into karate and then it went into kickboxing and then we done judo and it's just one of the situations it, it was a good it, good thing about martial arts and any boxing or thing, it respects that it, it takes the bully out of you you know, the bully comes out of you. So the reason you walk into a dojo and you, you bow your head, and if you didn't bow, go back out, you know. So really, it installed like sort of uh, respect for people, really, mm -hmm. basically. How did that deal with your self-control, self-worth, belief, confidence? Or because you could learn how to fight and you had that anger, did you utilise it in a different way instead of the more self-control and I don't need to do that? Because you can handle yourself, you felt, fuck it, I can take anyone on. Uh, when I was training like four or five times a week and uh, I wanted to, be a ch wanted to be a champion, but obviously things got me away. Um, money, I mean, started, it, it took a, a big change, sort of. Um, it, it, when, you, when you've done a lot of martial arts, it's really hard, or boxing, if you, you know, that take people down it. It makes you pretty confident. So really, basically, when I went into the robbery game, it helped me because obviously I didn't have to hurt people if I didn't have to. And if I wanted to hurt, I wouldn't hurt them. I'd hurt them in a way where I wouldn't have to hurt, you know, sort of drop them on the floor or, mm -hmm. or you know, just take them down quick, you know. So it helped me not to help hurt people because it's like someone grabs older, you just take their hands off. And, you know, and, and when you've been trained to do it year in, year out, it's like, it's like just something you do like a professional boxer and it's just but I wanted to do everything I just didn't want to do boxing I'd done karate I'd done the kickboxing I'd done judo and it was like it was it was good for me at my time and my age because obviously when you're growing up it sort of made you be able to look after yourself and I think when you grow up in the East End you had to look after yourself you know and I yeah. think it came in very saved my life in the prison system actually they've got a thing called uh, the chicken where they strangle you up and if I didn't duck my heads, or they went out stamping on me, smashing me with their knees on the top of my head as I was coming up with their knees and I was coming down, you know, things what's not just dropping your neck, you know. And I think it stopped me from getting seriously hurt, you know, when I was in the prison, because I got bashed up about three times seriously about, you get 20 men jumping on your heads, trying to kick you in the face with your friend nose blink, you know, and yeah. you get a really good kick in. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a kick in. And uh, I think then if you just the deflections and the drop of the neck and, you know, mm -hmm. covering your nuts, I think it saved me a lot of injuries over yeah. the years, yeah. Do you so. think the martial arts has saved your life and that's why you're still oh, here? Oh, many times, yeah, many times, yeah, especially in the prison system. Yeah. So when you're walking down a landing, the landing is only so as wide as this table. And you've got some lunatic, he wants to walk down there and every morning he's walking straight on. So you have to keep moving to the side, moving to the side. And uh, and then one morning say fuck it, I keep moving to the side, and then bang, and that's it. You, you hit shoulders, and next minute, you know, you, you, that's it. It's off. That's Having how, a tear up. That's, that's how easy it is in prison, mm -hmm. you know. And, and not to, that's why so get into prison. Uh, brutal prison really is. I mean, yeah. suicides and self harm has just gone through the roof. You've lost a lot of friends to suicide in prison. Over yeah, 11, ten friends, I believe. No, eleven. Eleven, 11 friends. Yeah. yeah, eleven friends. I think what it is until people go to prison. I don't think, and you come out at the end after a long time prison sentence, it's okay. It's funny, really, you get some little geezer who's a nobody down the blocks, 
and he'd be rolling all around with the screws. And the so-called chaps, a lot of them be sitting there eating their Sunday dinner, and you just think, this, this kid's got smells so we are. I mean, they're fighting the screws down there. And when you're down the blocks all the time, which most category A's are, and segregation units, I mean, that's where all the violence goes on. You know, that's where people kill themselves. And that's why I dislike the screws, because someone who's vulnerable, instead of trying to help them, I felt that screws were pushing them to kill themselves. So when you, when you go to prison, I just couldn't, I just didn't like the screws, I'm sorry. You know, it was anti-authority. I didn't. I, I never asked for, for parole. I didn't like people who spoke to screws. Oh, come and have a cup of tea, Jim. Come do this, all that fucking shit. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're, they don't like us, I don't like them. So, and that's a hard thing to say. So when a screw goes to say, Vic, I said, don't, my name's not Vic, mate. My name's B7, da 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 da, you know, dark. Don't call me Vic, I ain't your mate. And, you know, and that's how I, I've done my prison time, really. Yeah. What was your first ever robbery, Vic? Do you remember it? Uh, yeah, it was a building society. Yeah? Yeah. What was adrenaline like then, for your first ever robbery? Um, I think the, the, I think what it was, it, this is the problem you have in the robbery game. Um, it was so easy. I think because you'd done martial arts and things like that, and you had a 410, it was a little shotgun at the time, single barrel shotgun, and you're not there to hurt anyone. I'm just, I want to make that quite straight. We wasn't there to shoot anyone, it's just a warning. It's rather than go to someone, you know, sort of slap someone or something, just go, look, listen, don't, just do what I'm telling you, we ain't going to hurt you. And that's what guns are basically for. If a professional criminal is shooting people for nothing, to me, they're dogs. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, basically, because a lot of people, that, that gun was there for us to sort of say, don't come near me, do what I'm asking you to do, lay on the floor, I'm not going to touch you, just stay away from me, you know, and that's what guns How are How much was that in that first job? Oh, it was about fucking 200 quid. It was, it was, it was, at that time, it was phenomenal money for me when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I was only about, I was only, I think it was about just nearly 16, nearly 16 and a half. So as young as that, that's yeah. when it really yeah, and I started. And that was a, and it, and it was really funny because the security was so small then. It was like the money was literally in, um, if you went fishing and you'd open these boxes out where you had the, 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 that's where the money was in literally a mm -hmm. box and it wasn't like a safe or high security it was literally it was a joke so it was really weird it was it was it was too easy to be too good really yeah is that when you started getting the buzz for it and started to enjoy the money and it started progressing yeah. from there yeah it was like um because we, we had no money then you went to catapult where you had a lot of money it was really it was really weird because and the worst part about being an armed robber and into crime was the money's there, a bank, a sorting office, a security van. So as soon as I spent that money, I knew it was money, it was like, it's, it's like a tree, it's a money tree. And if you could, and the problem with armed robbers like myself, it would become like a drug where you think, well, I'm running out of money, that I'll go and do another, it's like taking a banana of a banana tree. And you, and you, but you can't, you have to keep going back to that banana tree. So really basically, when you get older, like we have done two big massive sentences for armed robberies. It's so hard to sort of go, like, you know, because I'm so used to ingrained in that way of life. It becomes like when, when people carry guns, it's like, it was norm for me. You know, it was a norm thing for me where uh, I'd have a gun under me, I'd have an holster with a 38 under me, and you wouldn't even know I've got it on me, or I'd have it at the back of my trousers, like two double belts to hold onto it, you know. And, uh, and you grew up like that. And the only problem, what what would come with it, is that invincibility that I could just do anything I want to do. Yeah. And, that, and that's how mad it was. What was your friends like then? What was your circle like? Well, the biggest problem we had was like, people would drop in and drop out. And people would want to do, and I mean, so I had some little geezer who was a small fellow, had fucking tons of arsehole, and I got a great big geezer, his arsehole falling out left and right. <laughs> so I never got a sight, I swear to God, it was, it was uh, honestly, honestly, I got a little geezer who was wrapped around me, he was half a gypsy, and I ain't joking, he had more arsehole than anyone I've known. And um, yeah, it, it's a lot of people drop in and drop out of it. That's the problem with uh, armed robberies, you know, vans or banks. Like, you need a bigger team to do the banks and the sorting offices. You need a smaller team to do the vans. You know, and then it steps over if, you know, it went into other parts of crime. Obviously, it'd just be one or two. And then the, most of the things I committed was one or two towards the end or very rare went in with the big teams because you had to split the money up then. So you must do a smaller job. Then. So, seeing you were doing the vans, 
or the banks was it planned or was it just a kamikaze just to go nah, in and all take? planned up all yeah. planned up yeah you have to watch you know, nothing happens you've got to know when it's turning up the van how long would it take to plan a job weeks weeks it's just knowing when it turns up you know sometimes it might be late it, it, you know it, 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 like banks good thing with banks and sorting offices was there station and station things like today like this is a a room got people sitting in that room it's open like from saturday to fun so you're never going to be in that room with a van it could get stopped on the and what happens the biggest thing is paranoia sitting in the back of a van what we used to do is we used to get a van spray the back windows and then scrape out a little bit of an hole have the two doors open we used to wait like that sort of sit there and you used to watch the van pull up the man get out and it bang you out the back of the van so Really basis the waiting game in that, but with a sorting office or a bank, you pull up outside, mask on, straight in, take the screens out. Like you'd come in, take the screen out with an hammer. The reason why we used hammers, that's how we got the name the Sledgehammer Gang, is because we didn't. I'd walk into places before, and I say to him, right, get on the floor, or open the window, or open the door, and he wouldn't. So we'll drop behind the screen. So that's how I bought the gang. When we was kids, we bought in the hammer. That's when I bought the sledgehammers in. Did anybody ever try and stop you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah. they? Yeah, of course I did, yeah, yeah. But like, once again, that's where martial arts come in, it, you know, yeah. micro bang straight down, mm -hmm. or, you know, lots of people throwing things at you, or the police. I had loads of run ins with the police, you know, so I won't say too much because I don't want to get no more birds, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you've done enough, Vic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was your biggest job? Well, really, I can't really talk about that, yeah. really, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I had some nice ones, yeah. 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 You got your big sentence for a robbery? Yeah. How was that before then when you get caught? No, what happened when um, when we was actually doing the banks and assault sort of offices and that? What happened? We had... Um, it was getting too regular. It was like... I was saying to people, Look, listen, slow down here. You're spending money. Like the geezer who, who, who was with me, he was uh, from Trinidad. I said, I'm going... He said, I get a new car. So I said, right, like, it turned out the biggest Camara you've ever seen in the world. It was a big yellow one. At the time, it was on Star Street Apes one, and no one had one in England. And I'm thinking, you turn up outside my house, you know, you're living in a normal house, he's got his fuck off great big car, and I'm saying, talk about put a blue light on top of your head. And that's what happened with a lot of kids. People can't help themselves but spend, spend, spend. And that's how it goes wrong as later life, you know, like people, old Bill, you ain't got no money, all of a sudden you've got loads of money. And so it goes, is this, is that? And that's why they come on you, you know what I mean? And that's what happened to us. Did you think, because you had a shoot up with the police? Yeah. How how did that come about? What happened, I, I was promised a, a van, and the geezers, the geezer, two geezers I was with, they said it, the geezer, it, it sort of fell through. So um, someone said to me, look, there's a bit of work, straightforward bit of work, wrap a couple of geezers up, 30 grand plus. And I thought, and the worst part about it, we had a nice bit of work about a few weeks before. And the two people I usually work with said, look, listen, enough's enough, you know, like, we've, you know, we've got a nice few quid. And I don't know what it, robberies are to explain. It's like you become a genuine junkie. It's like someone who wants to take cocaine. It's like you want to do more robberies. And then I was, and I was bored out of my head. Someone said, look, there's something down, down in, a, in a club called the Penthouse. He said, it's easy just wrap up a few people. And that was it. So the two geezers I was actually working with said, look, let's drop it out, fuck's sake, have a break. We just had a last few bits and pieces. And then it, and it, and I ended up taking the stranger with me. And then um, obviously went up there and it turned into a fucking, when I say a tear up, I mean it turned up into a serious tear up. And um, he, he was wrestling with someone, someone had got shot. He, he got shot, he got shot. And... Um, it just went from there, and then, and then we um, obviously a policeman was taken hostage. An Irishman sort of sounds like a comic, really. Of an Irishman was taken hostage. A child and his pajamas. His pants. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been laughing, but no, no, it's it, 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 it quite funny, really, because when I got the statement, when I got the statement, and they should laugh, really. And, and his wife said, his daughter said, "What's happened?" And he said, "They've taken John. They've taken John. He's only got his underpants on. It sounded like a nursery rhyme." <laughs> and, um, and that was really funny because. Um, I said to the old Bill at the time, I said, um, I had a gun at his back, and I said, tell him I want his keys. 
So he didn't. I had a two thirty eight. So I had one in that hand, one in that hand. I had one. I had two guns with me. And uh, the copper turned out, and he went to give me the keys because I can't take the keys. So, the, so I said to the fella, so the, so the Irishman's looked at me. I looked at him, and the cop was going, "Give me the keys." And I thought, I can't take the keys. If I have to take the keys, I have to put a gun down. So, so the cop just said to the Irishman, "Come on." And that's how it happened. I ended up taking him hostage. But I, I used the policeman to carry my mate had been shot, which is uh, no one's done it in England, Scotland, or Wales. We're in a surrounded building. Surrounded by police, I, told, I come out, confronted the police, made all the police back off. I had uh, about five police cars that got them to back off. All the coppers all sort of come running. I, I, I made them all run back. And, uh, I carried my mate. We got him out of the building. I had him across my arms. And the gun kept flicking around. I had one gun in one hand and the other gun fucking falling around my finger. Where he's trying to hold on to someone, every time I let go, he's fucking gun the 30 up. So I let go, that gun, that gun. And, like, gun, that gun. and uh, I've got all the police to go back. And then as we pulled up, and then um, I looked, I looked both sideways, I thought, I've surrounded here. So I just walked up, said to the police, get out of the car. I was going to take the car at first. And I said, put, got to put the gun to the coppers there, so I was getting back in the car. I got my mate in the car. I said, oh, it's a bit arse about forwards. I should have told you the first bit. And then I got him, um, I put him in the car, and then obviously he went for it, he had a massive chase. I just put a gun at the copper's neck. I said to him, um, sorry about that. That's okay. I said to him, uh, tell the, I said to him, put, tell the other ones to back off. Mm -hmm. So the copper, as I said that, we went over one of him, the only speed dumps. And then uh, with it, um, with it, um, with it a bump, and the gun's gone off, just missed the copper's head. So he thinks I've done it for purpose. And um, so the guns, obviously the wind has gone. So the cops gone. Please don't kill me. Don't please don't kill me. I went. Listen, just do what I'm telling you to do. So I want you to do just do what I'm doing. And then uh, so we ended up at the Irishman's house. Then um, we had a big tear up. I mean, literally they all backed off. And you know when they, they started forcing, I was the one who changed everything really about how they deal with situations because obviously I was the first one to actually take a policeman hostage on a bit of work mm -hmm. and I got him to carry my friends but in that town we had a serious tear up where uh, they was chasing the policeman it was going over roundabouts so I think and we hit a wall so we hit a wall and obviously the policeman was no good to me there because once I got him oh no we got to the Irishman's house and that's why I said I put a gun in his back got his keys and I chucked the Irishman in the car and then that's when we had a big smash up then I chased the police again, so we smashed that car up, so I started chasing the police again. You can see it all in the documents, it's all there. So I started firing a few shots, so their, their arseholes fell out, so all the police cars was going everywhere, I was chasing them everywhere, I couldn't get one. I fucking, how fast I was running, still couldn't get one. And um, so I let him go, the copper. But by that time, he'd carried me mate, he got him in a car. So really basically, I'm in England mainland, ever got a policeman to carry a critically injured person, and get him away. No one's ever done that in England, Wales, or Scotland. And I got him away. He never got caught. But obviously, I got caught doing it. So I didn't. at that time, when you're going through that, you know, if you get caught, it's life. Is that yeah. where you'd have been? It's killer, be killed kind of mentality at that point. Well, basically, I think you've seen things on telly where uh, they're in the ground, like Rambo, or and you're in the ground. Now, when I took the third hostage. I dropped him off, I kept throwing the door open and as we was getting the police was changed, I had about 15 cars behind me, obviously armed response, I could see him coming up behind me. And I look in the mirrors and I'm thinking, right, they're going to do me sooner or later because this is the third hostage. And this, is, this has been going on for nearly two hours. So I, I could see the cars coming up behind me and I was thinking, like, you know, as, you know when you see the shadows, those moving the Range Rovers, that's where you know the armed response are behind me. And I thought it's only been, going to be a matter of time before they're going to... Every time I threw a door open, they didn't know where he got out. So when I did eventually let him out, they didn't know where he was. He staggered into the house, the safe house. I looked like that and I thought, oh, I'm going to go in the safe house with him. But it was impossible because I had so many police cars with me. So I carried on. So he, 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 I knew he was safe. He was gone. He was safe. So uh, and then I carried on. And then um, and I thought I had a Chinaman hostage at the time. Well, it's a funny story, really, because his wife was trying to get in the car with me. I was pushing her out of my foot. And uh, like I said, on, and it was like, 
So, and I knew it was going to be a matter of time before we got that con confrontation. So, so we stopped, I saw the blue lights, and I stopped, and I looked that way, it looked like there's all police behind there, there's all police up there, and I thought, right, I need, I need a field. So I let the, the Chinaman go. So I was running into the field, and it was like, it was all, I'll never forget, it was like, it was about that deep, and it was muddy. And I was running, I remember my feet slipping, all that. And as I see all the, as the cars were pulling up, I saw the white coat, the white shirts, or the black jackets, all jumping out, obviously the arm response. And they was making time with me, because I was running. So I thought, so what I'll do, I'll just fire a few warning shots. So obviously I went bang, bang, but unbeknown to me, what happened there, the police car smashing into each other, coppers falling down, ditches switching, doing their ankles, all falling over in the mud. So when they chased me, lucky for me, this is safe, this is probably, I'm never probably going to get in a position like this in my life. As I run into the field, it had been raining. So what happens then? If you follow me into the field, obviously my only footprints would be that footprints, wouldn't it? Mm. But when I got into the field, all the police were running after me, the armed response units, I went bang, bang, dot, just a couple. That was above their heads. It wasn't at them, above them. Also, I know, so I thought, fucking hell, we're going to have to shoot me back guys. Yeah. So I thought, all oh, right, here we go. And as I was running, I could see all these headlights above me on um, coming across like that. So I know I'm trapped in the field. So I'm thinking, where do I go? What do, what do I go left? Do I go right? So as I, as I run, I slipped and I went down, went bang into the mud and I landed on my shoulder and the gun went off again. So it was about three shots that had gone off and I think, fuck that. So as I landed there like that, I thought, and I could see the cars, I thought, so I just buried into the earth. So I got all the, I got all the mud, started putting up. Started putting up my legs, putting all that, putting my body, putting it. I've got a few plants, stuck all the plants on me and all that. Put plants <laughs> around the edge. And, uh, and by that time, I could see that you could, obviously you can hear all the radios, mm -hmm. you can hear all the. All was the that a there? No, it's dark. It was about mm -hmm. four in the morning. And uh, it, and it's it, obviously it was, they're trying to get there. And then, um, so I laid there. And obviously all the talking, we could hear the talking going. All of a sudden, I could hear the. This is where I nearly got, I could have been killed or someone who'd been mm -hmm. killed. And I could hear him coming through the fields just about three hours later. And as I was laying there, I, and I could hear the dogs coming in. You know, the dogs, you could hear the, and it was like, yeah. lucky for me, where the rain, it was really rainy. The, the mud. The got, scent of it as well, yeah, the smell. With it, the mud was all over my body. Mm -hmm. So I was like, cocoon type of thing. So I was laying there, I had a 38 like that, and another 38 like that. I was laying there and I could, I could feel the dogs. At the corner of me, I could see a dog sniffing around. I thought he was going to fucking find me in a minute. So I've got one option, either shoot out, have another go with the old bill and run for it, or do I stay where I am? So I thought, fuck it, I'll stay where I am. And I'm like joking, honestly, James, a copper, they come right up to me like that, and it's falling. Now, when I fired the shots, all the police had run. So when I went into the field, because the police had chased me, where they had run, it confused them with all my footprints in the mud. Mm -hmm. And that's what saved my life. If I didn't let them shots off, they'd have just followed them footprints, stopped dead there where I was, and they would have known I was in that mud, buried, wouldn't they? Yeah. But where them shots went off, they all run and fucking splattered. And that saved my life, basically, because the footprints weren't going where they wanted to, because it confused them. Mm -hmm. But so when they started coming through the field looking for me, and I could hear them coming, and I'm thinking, fuck's sake. And, was, and it's walking up like, I see this geezer, and I could see him in the corner of my eyes like that. And he's literally got fucking great big one of them big machine guns. He's looking at me like that. And he's looking at the footprints. And I'm thinking, he's going to, and he literally, I, my foot is there. And his foot is where that table is. And he's going like that. And he don't know. I'm just sitting there like that. Got fucking 38, all planted up like that. And I thought, do I, don't I, do I, don't I, do I, don't I. You know what I'm saying? Do I yeah, shoot yeah. him, don't I? I know, if he goes to shoot me, I'm going to shoot him, you know? And that's how close I come to death. So they go through again. I think, fuck's sake, I got out of that. About another two hours, now it's getting lighter and lighter. So, so all of a sudden they come through again. Same thing again. And I think they're going to find me in a minute. Gonna... But what made save my life, really, basically, where those keep going through the fields, the, the more footprints, so we'll mix them up. which saved my life, yeah. basically. And then uh, I was laying there, and I got a thing called hypothermia, which I'd been in there for eight and a half hours. And it'd been light, it'd become daylight then. And I could see, and I ain't joking, when I say, oh, Bill, they even bought, you can, in the canteen, they bought a canteen there. It must have been two, three hundred police there looking for me. And they, obviously, and I was laying there and I thought, if they come through in the day and they see a foot, 
So I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna move and go to this there's all these plants and that so I thought, get over there, dig and I'll get even deep, deeper into there. And then I thought, well what do I get in and but then as I moved, the more earth come off me. So then it made me even more paranoid. So I started crawling along the floor. I get into all sound so I just fucking I was running everywhere. I don't know that someone's got me on binoculars, obviously through the ear he's just saying target, target, and then I just see all these old people running from everywhere. And I thought, hold on. And I, and I stood up, and we had been laying on my arm all night, because I was like that. I, I couldn't lift my arm up, so I, st I walked up, and it was like a like, 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 little fucking kids there. I was all saying, ah, oh, we got him, we got him, we got him. And then, um, so it gets me into, uh, gets me to the thing, they all running around like little, like little fucking kids, like, you know what I mean? And I thought, fuck it, so they got me. Takes me to a police station. So I thought, fuck it, I'll sit there, say nothing, blur, blur, blur. He goes, he's gunning his shoe, gunning his shoe, all that. So I went, wait. So I went, yeah, lovely. I won't tell what really happened because it's, it's what I about to say it happened. And then we uh, get to the police station, charge me. So anyway, but they want to have a bit of a tear up. There's a, there's a sex offender in there, it's big, some big lumps. So I was chinned him in the cell. Anyway, they want to get me out of there. So he takes me to court, puts me in a police van. I'm saying I was always really strong. I was doing a 150 bench for about six in at a time. And I just had these racket chuffs. Imagine I'm in a plate, just add all that tear up. So I'm in a van, I've got two years for this. So I went like, I went, ching, I couldn't believe it. it went, ting, just fell through. I thought, fucking hell, like, you know, it just fell through the racket club, like, you know, and I went, so if I move my arm, they got, so they had three coppers in the front, and I didn't realise the coppers all round behind. I couldn't see it because I had to be back to them, not in the van, but behind me. And I, and I thought, boom, so I thought, oh, yeah, touch now. But I'm in a, imagine this room here. I'm like that in a van. Mm -hmm. Let's say it was like a, um, like my armoured van with inside the van. So we got to this place in Gravesend's Road and I jumped up, ripped the side of the van off. It's called the Three Coppers. It was like that. What the fuck? So I ripped the side of the van off. It all bent down. Like, it was really weird. I thought, how the fuck did I rip the side of the van off? And they had windows like that, only small windows. So I stood back and went, fucking my Gary, and it went, come out, I couldn't fucking believe it. So then I get my hand through like that, because I was trying to feed myself through the, the hole, and the copper jumps out around the other side, so I went, grabbed him, and he's gone, ah, screaming, he's just pulling me, he's pulling me out of the van and all. <laughs> so I've got this side, I've got this side through, another copper's come, trying to grab me, I've grabbed him, and they're in their struggle, they're pulling me through the hole. And all of a sudden I just went, Phew. stay where you are. You know, you can feel a gun at the okay. side of your head, and he went, you move, I'll blow your fucking head off. But I'm still like that, the van, right? So they said to me, uh, right, we're going to put you back in the van. And I thought, well, I'm up three quarters out, like, you know, so I'm thinking, it'd be easy to just put me out of the van and walk me around. Them cunts, right, squeeze me back through the hole, right, like that. And that was it, all fucking sat on me, handcuffed up. Mm -hmm. I got two years for that. So really, basically, just one, just one fuck off. One fuck off tear up, then I yeah. get to Brixton, DC, it was the most secure unit in England. So the geezers aren't working, we're like, what the fuck's going on? Big tear up police, fucking has been hit to the penthouse, what the fuck's going on? I went out of here, mate, I've got to get me out of here, of course. Little firm tried to get me out, that's the flares come over the wall, I've done a screw. But, oh, mate, it's just, just for the first, just that's how it went. That's Everything madness. Went. So we, they hit the wall, the flare come up the wall. And um, in the in the prison system, it was, it was the most secure unit at the time. And how we got out, we got. I'll tell the story what happened. The only way we could get out of the actual unit was like imagine it's just a little unit, a con massive concrete box. That's all it was. You never come out of it ever. Only to go RC Church was Catholic, and I had to time from walking from church out the unit, which was like under yards. So I had to get it right. And we had an earpiece that we had a bug in the prison. So I was saying to him, like, don't fuck it up. Make sure you get there at the time, right? So I come out, and we come out, it was in this unit, and I'm walking with IRA geese and all that. They don't know what anything was going on, right? They ain't got a fucking clue, right? So I walks out, looks up the thing, my mate went to me, mate, like that, to send a signal, I'm out, meaning I'm out outside the block, outside the unit. So he sent the signal, like, he said, just put a thing like that, say, so I know my teams I work with, I knew they were going to be there, right? So I walked out, so there's a dog here, and I was walking with a geezer, a well-known geezer out of Bermondsey. So screw up, he had this leather glaive, and I hated this fucking screw, right? I thought it was a bollocks, right? So we're walking out there, and he was, there was a dog behind him, and it was him. 
So we get in there, and I ain't far from the church. So I mean, and the screw went, his leg, it's exactly how he had his leg went like that, right? <laughs> He's gone like on the floor. So I went bang on his head, and all of a sudden the old screws didn't know what to do. So I'm off now, I'm in between. And where it was the wall, there was a fence, the wall, and the reception. So I, I was off, and I run down. I, as I was running, I could hear the, I could hear him go, get him, get him, get him, because it was the dog light type mm. of thing. But I knew, so I had this jacket, and I wrapped it around my arm. I was, as I was running, I wrapped it around my jacket, around my arm, and I got between the fence and the wall, by that time, the flares hit the wall outside to say they're there, but it hasn't come over, it's hit the wall, and all the, flat, all the smoke was going up, was, all the smoke was coming up the wall, right? So the screws now know someone's yeah, outside, yeah. so they know people's outside, so the, all the flares going up like that. Yeah. So I stood there, they've come down, obviously missed the timing, this jumps out, they could sit on the, all the keys and balaclavas and the guns outside. Most This is the most secure England, jail in England, this was, and they've had to fuck off. So I'm fucked. I'm fucked now, haven't I? Mm -hmm. So this is this is a true story, right? So all the screws, about thirty screws outside. There's about thirty, about thirty screws outside, and I'm standing, and then all the kids out the window. You know, all the geezers in the units are up the window, shouting, "Leave me alone, you can't!" <laughs> all that, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, right, fuck it. So I looked. I looked like that. Looked like that. And all the screws going at me like that. I said, "Get on the floor." Get on the floor, and I thought, oh fuck it. I just run, smashed into them all right. Oh, that was it. I, I remember this gold ring going to me, smashing my face like that. I fucking kicks, punches, and everything. And of course, they wrapped me up, put me into a, got me back, took me into the, this segregation unit. The governor, because where the flares had come over the wall, they went, get him out of here, get him out of here. And they put me in a cage, and that's where I stayed for six months. So you put in a cage for six months? Yeah, and that was, I was in a little cage for six months. So within that period, I'd been nicked, big shoe out of police, taken old Bill hostage, nearly got killed, tried to get off a van, tried to get out of the most secure unit in England. Mm. And I suppose that's why they kept me a double A towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, that, is just, that was in with, like, say, within four weeks. I mean, that, that was That's like, like some Hollywood movie, that. That is nuts. So it is. See when you speak, see when you talk about it, does it bring back a lot of memories? Uh, gets you genuine, kind. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we've got you in this cage today. This yeah, is, yeah, a, this is yeah. so we can't escape. Yeah. yeah. So what it is is just that um, I was too I was too game for my own good, basically. Mm -hmm. Zero fucks <laughs> given. Sorry. Zero fucks given. Then at that point, it's like I don't know. I think what it was. I think going back to when you was a kid. Getting slapped and beaten, it's, it's, you've got that feeling. No, yeah. I'm not going to give up. If you get that switch, then if somebody does that, that switch just goes, and it's it's game time. Um, I think, I think, I think, through anger, and um, you know, it's hard to explain. You know, sort of, uh, you're gritting. You know, and one of those guys, mm. I'm gritting. You know, and then yeah. like I say, but the trouble is with um, when I was in prison, I had big earlobes. This is sort of thing, give you a rough idea. And I ate my earlobes. So I just cut them off with a pair of nail clippers. I cut big lumps off like that. I took two lumps out of my earlobes like that with a pair of nail clippers. So I said to the screw, he goes, you're walking, he goes, I said, look, I had this bud spurn out of my ear. So I put a bit of bongel and a bit of fag paper around it. I'm walking over and he just says to me, what have you done? I said, I didn't like my earlobes, just chucked my earlobes off. And then he got nutted off for that. But that was my mindset. If I didn't like it, I'll do it. Mm. And that's how mad my mind was at the time, you yeah. know, like, and to this day, I'm not mindset, because I've had all the programs, like, how to deal with... Mental health. Yeah, like, sort of, um, not mental health, how to sort of deal with... Anger. Yeah. Frustration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and like I said to you, today, and about fear, it's about, I'm going to lose my life, because... There's no boundaries for me. I'm I'm arrested. I'm going for the rest of my life. So if I step over that threshold, I might as well do what I've got to do. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or, or I'm going to die. Do you know what I mean? It's one. And I've got to control. I've got to control that. I've learned to control it. And um, and basically, I've, I've grown older. I've grown wiser. Mm -hmm. And like I say, when you talk to kids who, who, who are stabbing people for nothing, you know, I've done it, you know. And what I'm trying to say to the kids, it's a good thing, but you're going to lose your life. Like I did, 
I lost 20. It's a great thing telling a story and what really happened. It sounds all exciting. Yeah. But the fucking misery that comes with it, James, is unbelievable, mate. You know? Yeah. And that was your first big sentence. And yeah. then... No, second. Second. Yeah. I've done, I done 12 years, 15 years. I've done a three years. I've done mm -hmm. four, four, four months. I've, had, mm -hmm. I've, I've done a year on remand, a year on remand. I've done so really basically, yeah. So yeah. a lot of time. Yeah. So see when things now, Vic, obviously it is self-control. When you, you get that switch which flicks, how do you control it then for anybody watching who's maybe got anger issues or frustration or just maybe hate the world that they just don't give a fuck? How do you control that now? Do you meditate? Do you do breathing exercises? Or do you just don't act on your thoughts as much as you used to? Uh, what happens when... Um what kids have got to understand, when you become in a control unit, you treat it like an animal. So when you come out and you want to be back normal, you can't be back normal because you're in a room which is a third a quarter size of this. I've got one bed, a little bucket of pissing. When my doors open up, I've got five screws with right helmets on, putting bogies in my feet, standing to your back to the wall. So then all of a sudden you do this for year in, year out. You keep you in blocks for six months, a year, you can't go on wings because you're so subversive. You can't do this to keep you in the block. And you come out and you want to be normal again? No, you ain't fucking normal. So let me explain to that, Chuck. You come out and you ain't the fucking world, right? So until you be able to love someone, you know what I mean, it makes me emotional, really, because long-term prisoners are not treated how they should be treated. And then when you come out, no one's there to help you, only yourself. Yeah. What do you think needs to be put in place then? for prisoners in the system? Because let's face it, it's set up to fail. The majority of people who come out end up back in Vic. What do you think needs to get put in place to maybe help people with their mindset and understand that they're not caged animals, understand that they still have a life when they come out? I've spoke to plenty of people who've done some naughty shit and have changed their life and are doing great things. So what do you think should be put in place to try and help those who are struggling inside? I think what it is, um, I think a lot of people, especially long-term prisoners, have got, they need psychology, not, not, not psychology help, but they need to turn around and try and say to you, listen, try and understand what happened, you've got to try and understand what you are, where you're going, and try to learn not to put yourself back in that position. It's about fear, and about fear, because at the time, your life meant nothing. My life, if I died tomorrow, I was 20, it meant nothing. I've got, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And that's where today I'm 63. I don't want to die. I'm going to die anyway. I'm going to die in five, six years' time. I'm going to die. But when I was 20, I didn't give a fuck. So what I'm trying to say to you is that as life moves on, you've got to try and to adapt to sort of get yourself back to normality, to love again, to be normal again. And these people in the prison systems who's turning out fucking people who's done long prison sentences, especially ACAP prisoners, and wonder why they all go fucking mental and call away. Because it's a, it's a time bomb waiting to happen, right? Because you lock someone up in prison, say, for 10 years, and you brutalise him through them 10 years, like when you was brought up with your dad smacking you, you with a belt. It's the same thing. So it's like beating a dog with a stick. So you've got to try and get someone sitting down and say, listen, we're going to help you here. Yeah? We need to help you. What do you want? We'll try and get you a job. If you ain't got a driving license, it's kind of to get a driving license to do be a van driver, or go to a degree to go to university. You know, so really basically, when 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 Jimmy Ball from Scotland, they had these units where they could all mix together. With us, most of us like me, was like, we don't like you. You're in a block. You're subversive. Every time I turn up a prison, the screws are straight. They go, he's got to go to segregation unit. We don't want him on a wing. We don't want him on a the wing. There wasn't, and that's how it was. So um, you weren't allowed to socialise or anything. Yeah, we were allowed to socialise, but only for certain people. Like on my wing, on the wings, when I spent two years in some of them, there was only six of us, and like say four was IRA, right, and there might be another Englishman there, or ten. There'd be ten of us, and six, seven, eight would be Irish, and I'd be like kind of English people. It's like when I went back in the last one, it was more so Asians like all the terrorists and it'd be majority would be Asians and there'd be a couple of whites there because the double eight cat was brought in to deal with what they class as terrorists. And I, I, I'm not a terrorist. I'm not against, I wasn't going, I wouldn't go and kill people for the sake of it. 
I want to go, my, my object was nick a few quid. It's like, well, come out and we got into debt collecting. I found that someone could go and take a million pound off of you, actually fuck you for a million pounds. You go ask for your money back, you were arrested. Well, that one out. <laughs> Fucking, was I in the wrong job or what? <laughs> it's true though. It's, just, it's true, isn't it? It's true, James, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you'll be arrested to try and collect that million mm -hmm. pounds. Mm -hmm. So I'll, 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 it's because you was grained. Like when you get back to the East End, and you look at your you look at your childhood, and it is poverty. It's like when you look at kids who who've got nothing. You have got these Alan Sugars. You have got all these people, millions and millions of pounds, like the Queen, the Queen lives in big houses and all that. It's like look, today I was watching the telly about Liverpool. All them people lost their lives because he was a cop. He was he was acquitted. Mm -hmm. You tell me one police officer who's been found guilty. There was a geezer in uh, in Kent. He walked in. And um, he had no clothes on. He was in a bed and they shot him dead. No one's arrested. So it's, it's a big government thing. Yeah, so it's not even self-defence or anything. Nah. Well, that's the biggest gang in the world, let's face yeah, it. Yeah, he's the biggest gang in the world. You know what I mean? Did you have a lot of anger inside, Vic? Then getting treated like that, do you feel as if you were getting bullied again inside there, the way you were getting treated? Yeah, like when I was a kid, yeah. I thought yeah. I was, like Charlie Bronson's a good friend of mine. I've I known Charlie for a long time. The, the system made Charlie Bronson the Bronson is the system. That's his mum and dad. They lock him in cages, treat him like an animal, right? No one's, I know he's got a bad terrible record, but underneath all that, he's a nice person, Charlie Bronson. He does all his art. Still kept, he's never killed anyone. He's still banged up now. And this is going on. I've got loads of mates who are still in there now, like my co-defender. He's never coming home, right? And he's got these other kids, outrageous murders like kids and things like that. And they treat people more like me, who's, who's after a few quids, a lot worse than what they do child if They want to bang us, up, want to lock me up, you know. Yeah. There's pedophiles out there just getting six months, the third sentence, 18 months, and they're doing some nasty shit. Do you know what I mean? But again, the system is flawed. There's a fault in it. It's yeah. set up to fail. What was Charlie Bronson like then? How's, how's he? He's he still in good contact? Uh, it was a funny story. We was in, we was in Franklin's and... Um, there's only like 10 Cockney eyes. He's turned up that Kenny Noise fucking shook the game was in. And we all went, what? I thought, really? So you know, don't do things like that, mate. And then um, the geezer turns up, I'm standing with a fella, and uh, he walks out and sees the graphs. Well, I knew him from, I knew him, what he'd done, he was, he was strapping bombs to security guards, right? I knew all about it because people that come from my area. Most armed robbers were sort of brought up in their areas, you know who they are. Like, if you watch a film called Town, Boston was the main thing for armed robbers. Canning Town and Stratford was a breeding ground for people like me, you know, so. And uh, so anyway, calls him a grass. You know, so well done, Mark, so I sweep the geezer's legs, kicks the geezer in the head, knocks him out on the floor. So Bronson went, fucking hell, Vic, what the fucking kick that was? And I went, yeah. All of a sudden, now all the screws come out. We are in Franklin Prison. And they were trying to take me off the yard, right? So they'd come walking over. I went, we're coming in. So me and Bronson, all about, so the Cockney eyes were fucked. We have to have it off with the screws. So we had a big punch out of the screws. They've run. They've run. Uh, they've run. All the screws have run, started locking the cells in the blocks and that. So they goes, right, let's take the jail over. But never, never, ever happened in Franklin before. So I said, I think, fuck me, I'll start this off. I'll get another 10 here, right? So I was going, come on, let's just lay you. So they lock the cells. Like, anyway, it'll get, it all gets calmed down. Then it goes off again, and then, and then Bronson's involved in it again anyways. So they put me down the block. So they said, right, if you don't come out the block, don't get him out the block, we're going to smash your jaw up, right? So anyway, so uh, they give in. So this is a funny story, this is so... They said, right, we want to see, we want to give, we want to hear what you want to say about Cockney A's or, Co or Cockney double A's. He said, we want to hear what you said. So there's going to be three governors, bring three inmates and we'll sit down and the go stop the beatings and all that's what we wanted, right? So he goes into the governor's office. There's a governor sitting there, governor sitting there, governor sitting there. I, think I, was, I was with Nicky Dunford at the time, so we walked in there. There's another category. Eh? So I said, right, what do you want? All of a sudden the door goes, bang, the door flicks open. And I ain't joking, he's standing, bollock naked, big pair of boots on. He had a fluorescent <laughs> tube off out the light. <laughs> and he went to the governor's, no, no. Trap. And I'm joking, them three governors sat there like that. They sound like Tom and Jerry. They went, they <laughs> <laughs> sort of slid through the things like that. And, and that's how, that's, that was Charlie Bronson. He was just like a, uh, 
a fucking character. Yeah, because he only got jail for a robbery at the time. Yeah. Now he's over 30 years. Yeah, and he's still in there. I mean, like, there's loads of people in there like him who should be let... Who, who Do you think he'll ever get out? I hope he does. He's a nice bloke. I hope yeah. he does. There's loads of people like Paul Glenn. He should be released. He should be there. Who's he? He's my Cody friend. He, he yeah. never killed that person. Mm -hmm. He should be released. Yeah. Well, not, he, he was there. He's going to get some bird, but don't lock him up for the rest of his life for something he didn't do. Yeah. Do you think it's because of who these person people are associated with as well that the police try to get them off the streets and just lock them up and throw away the key? We was in a murder trial because he committed a murder before he's guilty. You know, so that's how people are. That's how the police work. Mm -hmm. You see, like you know, like these kids today, like they run around their mobile phones. All they're, they're like fucking grasses in phones. Yeah. The best thing that ever happened for the police to have mobile phones. They're like trackers in their own right. You know. Mm -hmm. So your first. 12 year sentence Vic what was that sentence for? that was for the banks and sorting offices and yeah. the other one was a shootout with the old bill the old bill how many did they charge you with the first time round? four and that's four. where you got your 12 stretch? yeah the two banks one sorting office and a security van how was your what age were you then? just turned 21 22 still young one yeah, 22, yeah. yeah so when you came out did you just go straight back into crime? yeah that's right away, yeah and then you got your bigger sentence for the shootout with the police, the hostages. Yeah. What was that one? That was that was uh, about eighteen months later. Mm -hmm. It's just like what it was like. See what people talk about principles. I've been brought up as the old school. He'd been shot. I could have left him a few. I could have, I could have walked away from him. Ten times. I could have put my clothes back on, disappeared, got out in the crowds, and just disappeared. But because we brought up like the old school, I weren't going to leave him. Loyalty. And, and it's that's how we've been brought up in the East End. And what I'd like to do is try and get back the old school, help the granny across the roads. Don't grass on your mate. About these knives, don't fucking help the old Bill. Put the knives, chuck it in the stream. Go and talk to your parents. Go and talk to your uncle. Give them the knife, say, I want to get rid of this knife. You don't have to work with the old Bill. We can do it ourselves. We're working class people. We don't need them people. Do you know what I mean? We don't need the old Bill. We can do it ourselves. We can tell the kids to put the knives down, right? We can tell them to put the knives down. We don't need the police. We don't need fucking stuck up MPs. Mm -hmm. Just tell them to put the knives down. Don't give it to, don't, don't give the old bill a fucking propaganda. Chuck the knife away. Because that knife, I'm joking, you kill something like that, as easy as that, 20 years, that's what happened to me. And you ain't going to come out the same person. Yeah. Times. One second, then, and your life's gone. You don't just yeah. defect your, your own life, but also the victim's life. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. So for anybody, that's maybe carrying a knife maybe for a bit of protection it's difficult as well especially if they're getting bullied at a younger age and they feel as if they've got that for that protection what advice would you give for them then? Go to the gyms learn train train hard I trained hard at take knives off of people you know I, I don't mean as you said you know, you, you've heard it for loads of people don't yeah. you I, try, I should train them in prison you know yeah. so and uh, like I said it's easy said and done you know, yeah, because Blink's a, a friend. I know you were in prison with Blink. Um, yeah. And he says, you used to have a knife and you used to get people to charge you and used to throw <laughs> them over your shoulder. And Yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's just training. Mm -hmm. But like getting back to kids who carry knives, I carry knives. Mm -hmm. You've got to be strong enough to walk out of that house and say, I'm not going to carry a knife. Like most of the time in my life, I always carried a knife. And it, most of them carry a knife. I'm going to tell you now, most people carry knives not to use them. But if they carry knives because someone else who is carrying a knife, and that's the problem we've got to get over. We've got to get over that that person carrying a knife feels safe. He's carrying a knife, so that's how. It, and that's the thing we've got to get over. And about mm -hmm. people carrying knives, because I don't think most people go out with intentions unless you're a psychopath to stab someone for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, like, well, do you want to stab someone? Because like, what's happening now with these kids, there's it, been a picture just come out where they want to, he crosses a road into another, this is ridiculous, you know. Yeah. You want to kill him for that. Yeah, Glasgow was the, cap, the ninth capital yeah, in uh, Europe for yeah, many was. years yeah, and it it's yeah. changed, the system's yeah. totally changed. There's, they carry a knife, it's in a walking indi indictment, but the, their sentences got higher, three years, five years for carrying a blade yeah. and it's changed. Yeah, yeah. I've got 12 months for carrying a knife. I've got three years for a stabbing. Mm. So what I'm trying to say to the kids, put the knife down. I mean, it's okay me telling stories, and it, and like people listening to them. But I've done mm. a lot of birth for them yeah. stories, and I was going, I was a game fucker. But I'm just saying to the kids, put the knife down because mm -hmm. you, you know 
you're going to prison for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it ain't nice in there, mate. Yeah. I, I was standing in the units. This geezer's killed six people. That geezer's killed five people. That killed, killed three people. And they're all standing with knives in their jackets. And, and you know, they're cooking their dinner. They've got a fucking open knife there. And you're standing next. I was brought up in it, in, in the units and that. Everyone's told up. And in prison, that's why I was self-harming. There was a girl I knew. I took, she came out of prison. She's doing a life sentence. She'd done 12 years. She's just come out of prison. I took her to have a tattoo. She wanted a tattoo done. And my mate said, no, I can't do that. And I turned around and her arms were cut from there to there, so far. Her legs were cut to bits. And then I went, just grabbed her arm and said, I'm so sorry. You know? And that's yeah. what and that's what people do, they self harm, they kill themselves. Don't think, you know, you want to be fucking Billy Big Bollocks, you like you're gonna go into a, a place you've never been before, mate. Yeah, that's a lot of people who think that the game is people out in the streets, but as soon as they get in there, the, the mindset can't handle it and they commit suicide, end up on the drugs. Did you see a lot of that in there? Lose a yeah. lot of friends to drugs and suicide. Yeah, like I say, people, people run. People, people, look, look, you know, I'm not going to say it, but look, you know, people count on drugs in jail. You know what I mean? So that's how they do their prison sentences. But like I said, until we get under control, not about prison system, I mean about kids killing each other. Yeah. But you, know, you need to, Someone's got to get up. A celebrity who's listening to this, or someone. We need someone who's going to put and a slogan, put the knife down. But people so, listen to you, Vic. Do you know what I mean? Somebody who's been there, someone who's done it, someone who's experienced that, spent a lot of time in prison. You know how the pain it causes, not just on yourself, but your family and the victims. Oh mate, I ain't joking. When I lost my mum to cancer, I, I, I'm the toughest geezer in the world. But fuck me, mate, did I go through it? So imagine someone who's lost their life, who's just lost their young kid who's 14, 15 years old. I mean, the pain they're going to go through, and the one who's done it, the pain he's going to go through. So, you know, we'll think you, you know, you jack the lads, but it's, but there's no winners in that game. Do you think about the victims as well, Vic? Obviously, when you did those robberies and vans and banks, do you think about the people who were in the bank at the time, how their mindset would have been and the trauma they would have received? They ever think in your mind and you go, maybe? No, it's my super troubles. Well, look, you're young, yeah, and you don't yeah. see it. I mean, when you get older, you can see it. I mean, when I, when I, when uh. When you get older, I mean, like I sit there sometimes. I have a tear in my eye. Someone's died, or this is done, and like you know, I'm not, the, I'm not, the, I'm, I'm quite an emotional person, you know. And then, like I say, but there's so much. I mean, our biggest battle's cancer at the moment, you know. So, oh, yeah. I mean, people, mum, I lost my mum to cancer. She couldn't, she couldn't eat. So I watched her die, you know. She couldn't drink, she couldn't eat. And it's one of the most horrible deaths I've ever seen, you know. Oh, yeah. She just went through a bag of bones. And, mm -hmm. So really basic, then you watch someone else who's just crying their little kids in their hands who just mm. died at 14, 15, 16, for what? For just because you look the wrong way. Mm. I mean, come on, there's a big difference between us, money getters, and someone who wants to be hooked on violence. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hooked on violence. I, I have to be violent if I have to be violent, like I said, but at the end of the story, that's a no-no for me. I wouldn't want to hurt someone for nothing. Yeah. Did you ever have a a target in your head to make a certain amount of money and then disappear or was it just keep going and keep going until we eventually couldn't go anymore uh, when you put a gun in someone's hand and a mindset at that time it's like kryptonite to superman as soon as I went like that bang it's like <laughs> dumb a gun you are fucking powerful and then, and so you get out of that boat, you say, I'm not going to touch that gun. I'm not going to go near that gun. I walk in and I just go, you bang, you're gone, mate. That's, you are God. That's a mindset you are. Mm. You can just, there's nothing, you can't stop me. If I come out of my house in the morning, hunt you down, and I'm mindset, I don't give a fuck about anything else, you can't stop it. It's like a robot. It's like the Terminator. You can't stop it. And that, that's, that's the problem. So you get out of that mindset, in your own invincibility and and, and you realise you're hurting people and you're doing things what you shouldn't do, you've got to try and understand that. And then me to understand it, I started trying to understand it. I started really sort of thinking different about it. So I was 44, 45. In prison? I want to come home. I want to meet someone nice. I yeah. want a bit of love. I want this. I want that. And, you know, I've got it. What, what keeps me out of trouble now is what I've got. You know, I'm not... What switched it for you then, Vic, to be that person that you were to start to understand and have emotions and feelings because you tend to see the toughest people tend to suppress their feelings and emotions they don't want to show emotional motion anger they'll express it through anger and frustration but they'll not 
don't want to feel vulnerable. And that's where that sense of having a gun, putting it down, people get scared. That adrenaline kick, you feel important, you feel power. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So what yeah. made you, what was the catalyst for the change to start going, this, I don't want this fucking life life anymore? I'm running out of life span. I mean, I, you know, like, you'd be like, people come, I mean, there's a robbery there, right? It can't be done. There's this. He's going. There's too many people there. There's that. You can't do this and you can't do that. And that's like putting something to me. You can't be done. And I go, I'll do that. It's just saying in your mind, I I, I want to do that. I you, I can't. It can't be done. I want to do. It. I've done bits of work, which have been all over the papers. That they say it can't be done, but I've done it. And then what happens? You, it's trying to get out of that mindset. No. Tell me this, Vic. For the ages of 21 to yarn now, the people you were in some serious fucking jobs with or some serious events, how many of them are still your friend now? A lot of them are dead. A um, lot of them are dead. Other grass is dead, whatever. I've still got a few friends. We've got, we've got loads of friends. Associates? Yeah. Look, look we're an underground organisation. I mean, that's where we work. I mean, we don't stand in pubs 20 handed. Today's totally different. Talk about the craze, the craze you can stand to out, there's a word called conspiracy. The old Bill stick that conspiracy charge on you just like that. So they conspired this. Or you could be with me now, James. Mm -hmm. I could be doing something. I've got my arm around you, take a picture, so oh, James is involved. Association. It's different, yeah. man. It's different. You know, mm -hmm. and then like, you know, the way they sit on you now. And they've got a license to kill because of terrorism. They will kill you, they'll kill you. You know, you've got to be really careful. Even bugs, I mean, I said to people, I've, I've helped loads of people out where I found bugs in their car, bugs in, the, in their houses, little black bugs. Oh no, I wouldn't bug up. They wouldn't bug me. Fucking hell, I found, I saved someone 24 years, I found a bug in his steering wheel. So what I'm trying to say to you, they're, they're, they're good at their game. Yeah. They're always, they will always catch you one way or another. That's, that's right, yeah. That's where the This friend... is the thing now, the bugs on the kids. Yeah. Got, see what happens, technology now, we use it, we put trackers on cars and things like that, right? We want to know where people are. So their technology are fucking hundreds, hundreds better than mine. Mm -hmm. And the prison system's been turned against you now. So that I'm going to tell, you know, you, like, you go to court, they've got every, where before you had a, they could bring your record out, they can bring tape, because a lot of people don't know now. You, you'll talk on the phone, they can bring that in court against you through the terrorism law. So you use the terrorism law to bring all the, what they wanted to bring in the government. That ain't stupid. Don't tell you when you get to court to say, my, when I was arrested last time, I was never nicked for murder before. They got my past out, and I got a bad past, because my mate had been nicked for murder before. So how they do it, the system now changed against you really big ways. So most of these kids are going up for knife crimes, they're all getting arrested. All... So do you think this is the best time for people who's involved in a life of crime, is to get out, change their life, and see that there's a better life out there? It's difficult, though, if you grew up in that environment for 20, 30, 40 years, Change doesn't just happen overnight, but it can be done. Your yeah, prime it example, actually, it can yeah, be done. It can be done, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It can be done. Well, the Paul's turn is around, Paul Ferris. Hmm. Loads of people, you know Paul Ferris. Yeah, yeah, no problem. He's well. a nice fellow, his yeah, brother yeah. Billy. I was away with his brother Billy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's turned his life around. We, we can do it. Yeah. We can do it, you mm. know, we can do it. You know, we really can, you know. And uh, you happy, yeah. James? You were, cheers, you were charged with one of your serious charges, which was murder. How was that experience for you, Vic? Uh, it was horrible, really, because I was 320 miles away from a, uh, a murder and someone had asked for someone to sort of, not to kill anyone, just to say, have a word with someone. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, here's a number. And that was me, charged with murder. That was me, locked up for a year, fighting for my life. Helicopters, going to court, five police cars in front, five police cars behind, helicopters up there sitting and trying to go around, look too and get me a guilty for a contract murder, which I on paper wasn't even a contract murder, they offered me eight years. So I pulled out a bit of paper at the trial and said, oh, I'm nicked for a contract murder. Here's a bit of paper saying they're gonna nick me for GBH with intent, which calls up Roy, isn't it? You can see it in the papers, he's on my website so that. Mm -hmm. Try to set me up for a contract murder I didn't even do. Yeah. You know, so, you know, and that's what I'm trying to say, it's that easy. I, I, that was one call I split up with the girl I was with. I was locked up for a year. Was there a, was there a thanks? Was there a fuck? And I was gutted I got her not guilty. You know, I didn't even do it. Did that give you a, a more anger again? Yeah, I was really angry. Yeah. yeah. I was fucking angry. Towards because at the end of the story, they sit, see, a lot of people, when you get into major crime, 
the system's, you know, you walk into that system and it's all geared up against you. You know, like the courts, the police, do you know what I mean? The police, and, and it's all against you, you know what I mean? So don't think that you're going to get a fair trial. Like I've said, if I get a guilty on this, I'm going to walk because I've never done it. He went, no, you won't. You get guilty, you ain't never getting out of jail before. Because them freedom judges ain't going to free you because of my past. I mean, I was sitting there, I was getting released, and I, I thought I was coming, I thought I was going to get dropped to normal um, strategy when I got released from Franklin Prison. I thought I was going to get released, and I walked out, I walked with us three, three governors were sitting there, and he went to me, um, we've got a warning for you, Dark, right? So I was just standing there, because I have to tell you before you get released. They said, um, trouble you what you are, there's a line. And they say to you, you come up to that line, and most people stop at that line. He said, you can't. You have to put your foot over that line. He said, we're going to tell you now, you keep doing it, you're never going to see light, daylight again. And that was from a threat, that was a threat from a prison governor. So I went and really? Like that, and he went, yeah, really. So it was a warning to me before I even got left out of the jail. I, had, I don't know where he's from, I've never seen him before. He's from the home office of what? He was telling me in a nice way, he's going to lock me up for the rest of my fucking life. You've been off the radar for over 10 years, Vic. Yeah, eight years. How was that period for you? Was that about a recharge and trying to think where you're going with life? Uh, no, what it was, I think what it is, I found, I, I met a girl, and uh, I've become like a family man. And uh, I've, I've got really good friends around me who are loyal. Um, we don't see each other, but they're friends. They're always there, always will be there. If you need them. Yeah, if we need them. I've got, we, look, I've friends. The only trouble prison do, they give me... When you talk about the underworld, the underworld's built from the prison systems because I can walk into a pub, look across that pub, and I know he's been in prison for eight years for armed robbery three years for violence. So they make, by putting people in prison, they give us our own, like I'm friends with, from Scotland, down to Dorset, I know everyone up and down the country. That's my PowerPoint because where well, I've been in prison 10 years, oh, when I was a double A cat, I never come back to, to Cock, well, Cockney lands. I was in Franklin, Full Sutton, Long Larton. I went to Parkhurst. I never come back to London for nearly nine years. So when I come back to London, I have to spend all my time up north in the, in the units and the control units and that. It was really weird to hear all people talking like me. It was, it was like yourself, James, Scottish, mm. Geordies, Scousers, Mancunians. And it was really weird because I got, and I went, I got back south and the, the screw went, do you want a cup of tea, mate? And I thought, fucking hell, that's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that's unusual. I thought, that's unusual because I was surrounded by, I, I spent 10 years with Northern Connection. Mm -hmm. So when I come home, obviously I know I've got... I, you know, I talked to people up down England. Yeah. You know. How was the experience after the Danny Dyer documentary? Because everybody knew you then. Everybody knew. People knew who you were anyway because of the reputation, but that must have enhanced that. Did you find a lot more people will try to speak to you? Did, they, did you ever like, get used? People always want to be your friend and because no, of the power that work, you it, had. It, it don't work like that, James. You don't, it honestly don't work like that because what happens with prison, it, it makes you antisocial. So really, to get close to me, you've got to be someone special. Yeah. I mean, like, my friends are special because like, I've got some really good friends where I trust them with my life. Mm -hmm. And they'll and they'll turn up and they go, you all right? I go, yeah, I'm fine. They go, all right. No problems, we'll disappear. Yeah. Because that's what we are. We're an underground system. All this about standing around, giving it, all these gangs running around together, all their woods on, all that. Fucking they know who you are. <laughs> Fucking they know. Did they have books? That's new camera, mate. Do they know, they know who you are? Yeah. Put a bug in your house, put a thing in. You know, listen, let's, let's go up, let's go up a league. Mm -hmm. let's, let's work out how the government really works, right? I had, I had security guards outside my house, right? Security guards, my fucking arsehole. That was old Bill sitting on me, mate, for five fucking weeks for something I didn't even do. This is only a little while ago, right? And I, I knew that was old Bill. There was police out, and one of someone had said to him, Can we get in the back of his house? Want to get at the back of my house? For fuck what? So yeah, you're I've got still cameras getting, there. That's why I've got cameras, I've got dogs, with everything. Like, you're you know, still getting grief then yeah, to this day? Yeah, never going never gonna to fucking back off. Yeah, that, I don't but. think so because obviously the reputation you had. So through all your madness, Vic. Now you're trying to get a six-part series. Is that in talks, I hear? Yeah, brilliant. Um, we've, look, I've, I'm writing with a great team. I mean, his name's Ben. He's a writer. He's, he's helped work. He's done Warhol. He's done a £12 million film. We're doing a six-part series. 
is from when I grew up since I was a kid. Goes into armed robberies and all that. It's like a film called Heat. Mm-hmm. Ben, it's another film called uh, uh, what was it called um, with uh, Ben Affleck in it? Town. That's actually I, I watched that film. Yeah, that the boys from Boston that go around all the banks that's and that's that. That's yeah. exactly the six part series been wrote on that. I've got a great team man who's doing it for me. Uh, a lot of plug it if we can, John. Of course we can. We'll yeah. leave everything on the bios, everything that uh, Vic spoke about, even your book and stuff as well. Yeah, um, but anybody we can get in contact with, we'll leave emails out the bios, so check the bio out. Oh, love so, it, Vic, yeah. yeah, not a problem, Vic. But for, f- moving forward for the future then, and getting this sixth part out, the massive thing that you're doing now is speaking out about no, knife fine. crime, yeah. which is massive for you. Yeah. Does that make you feel a bit better as well that you're trying to help others? Yeah, and doing I've, something natural that's good for I you. All, all the time we've been put down, right? Everyone says you're this, you're that, you're this, that. But we've got good art. We're, we're old school, right? And the kids got to learn, put the knife down. All, all the slogan is put the fucking knife down. Like I said, don't use, don't help the old bill. Throw it away. If you've been bullied, go to another geezer who can bully them. Do you know what I mean? Talk to your brother, talk to your dad, talk to someone. You need help, right? Don't go to the old bill. Just say to him, listen, I need a bit of help here. But most, always give someone a way out. When you're in confrontations with someone, give someone a way out so it don't have to come you or me. That's what we do. I don't want to kill you, you don't want to kill me, right? It's just my jungle, you want to kill me, I'm going to kill you, right? Give them a way out, and I want a way out. We don't want to kill each other, do you know what I mean? That's what we look for, that's what you've got to do. All these young kids, give someone a way out. Give yourself a way out, because if you get... You, you know, you, you're going to end up dead. One is going to be you're seriously injured. Mm-hmm. Give each other a way out so you can slip through the back door and don't lose face. Mm-hmm. So we've got to do. What do you think of bullies, Vic? Look, we've got bullies all our life. I've been bullied. I've been bullied by the prison system. I've been bullied by my dad. I've been bullied by fucking kids in school. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a part of life. You know, not, you know and, and the good thing about us, you know, we're not going to get bullied. So... Would you like to leave a final message for anybody watching, Vic? Yeah, for thanks any... for you, James, for giving yeah. us an interview. Like a really much absolute being, pleasure, yeah. no. And then, like I say, you know, like, um, you know, poverty, let's sort the poverty out. Mm-hmm. Let's knock down all the rice flies. Let's get, make drugs legal. Let's ask all the kids to put a knife down. Mm-hmm. Just go and talk to someone. Please, don't, don't kill someone for the sake of it, okay? But Vic, I know you don't do many interviews, but for coming on today and telling your story and, yeah, thanks, mate. So and um, OTT, I, I really but, appreciate it but yeah. it's um, I understand we spoke about your whole life and obviously the, the stories that some people want to hear but the main objective is not to make the same mistakes you did people True. can change people can better your life even though all the shit you went through in the past it's made you who you are today so I respect for you for coming on here mate telling your story and I really appreciate it so God bless and good luck with everything for the future and long live Scotland yeah (laughs) (laughs) thank you you very much